I'm Dan Olds, and today the subject is weather forecasting in WARF. This is one of the applications that's going to be used in the upcoming student cluster competition at ISC, and it's a, uh, an application that's been used in uh, student cluster competitions in the past. And today we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Jordan Powers and Dave Gill with us to talk us through what WARF is and uh, how to make the thing sing. Jordan, say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Dan. Uh, I'm Jordan Powers, and I'm a scientist here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. I do computer weather forecasting, which technically is, is known as numerical weather prediction. And the model that you mentioned, which is called WARF, is a, uh, a key tool in doing this today. Excellent. Dave, say hi. Howdy do everybody, my name is Dave Gill. I'm one of the software engineers that support the WARF modeling system. What I do here is primarily as a software engineer, I work on the, the source code structure, the, the Fortran, the, the C, uh, the, the language interface, the scripting to get the whole build mechanism. And I'm also part of the user services team because they're about 20,000 folks out there that have downloaded and used the, the WARF for their daily forecasts. You two are definitely the right folks to talk to, I would say. You seem to know your way around this a bit. Well, both Dave and I have been doing it a long time. I'm more of a, a scientist and uh, use the model for, for forecasting and analyzing the weather and studying meteorology. And Dave is uh, one of the guys who has built this system, and he knows very well the, the software and hardware background and needs for it. Excellent. To start, what is WARF? How does it work? WARF uh, is, is how we pronounced uh, the acronym WRF, and these letters stand for Weather Research and Forecasting. And the model is called the Weather Research and Forecasting Model, and it's a set of computer code that really simulates the atmosphere and its evolution, which is, is the weather in layman's terms. So this model uh, has existed. Uh, it was first released in 2000 and it's uh, evolved since then, and it is the uh, probably the most widely used model of its type to forecast the weather in the world. It is used by official government agencies for official government forecasting. For example, the National Weather Service of the United States. It's used by foreign governments as well. The other uh, segment of users is that uh, of uh, folks in research, uh, and they, they use it to simulate the atmosphere to study things like hurricanes and tornadoes and winter storms and uh, whatever you can think of. They will try to recreate with this model. It provides three-dimensional data sets uh, with weather information that uh, points throughout the atmosphere, and, and, and with this detailed information, we can really get a good picture of how things uh, behave. Or how things would behave under certain conditions. Correct. It can be used to uh, set up idealized scenarios or go back and uh, recreate certain events to understand what happened. And this is under the category of one hell of a complex model. It is. Dave, perhaps you can tell us how, how big WARF is, but uh, it is. It's very computer intensive, and uh, we run it on the fastest supercomputers. But Dave, can you tell us about uh, what WARF looks like underneath the hood? Sure. It's about uh, half a million lines of code if we just talk about the model proper itself. It's primarily written in Fortran, uh, and there's some C code that's inside to help us build the, the code itself. The building mechanism, when the, the folks start getting involved in this, is located uh, inside the WARF directory. There's an ARCH and ARCH directory. Inside there, there's a configure underscore new default. That's where people are going to start putting in their modifications if they want to uh, play around with and do some tuning for the way that the model is going to behave. Once you do the uh, configure uh, command, you end up with this configure.warf file. That file has all of the compilation options that the uh, folks are going to need to, to modify. Right now, if you look at WARF, we have some people who are making efforts to try to add some GPU and some mic technology, and it's, it's not available for prime time yet. One of the problems with WARF is that it's fairly flat, so that there really isn't anything that sticks up that you would want to say, okay, this I'm going to throw over to a GPU and get it to process this. The dynamics is about 30 or 40 percent. The physics is about 40 percent. Uh, the infrastructure and the I.O. You take up the balance of that, so there's no nail that sticks way up in the air that you want to identify. One of the pieces when you're messing around with the WARF code is there are enough things that are 
unknown about the atmosphere that you really don't have to say, I'm going to run these things in uh, double precision. So uh, using 32-bit uh, floating points for folks is going to be uh, just fine. The WARF model decomposes quite well. There are people who have run the model on a suitably large enough domain size up to uh, uh, several tens of thousands of, of processors and, and, you know, heading towards a uh, uh, 10 to the fifth processors and such. What uh, WARF will do is it will, as any application, it'll tend to knee over in performance if you get to a point where there's not enough work for the um, to, to amortize the uh, amount of communications that you're doing. So it does uh, scale out pretty well. It's fairly parallelized. If you have a big enough job, WARF will scale quite well. So depending on what the people who are constructing the problem for the students throw at them uh, depends on how many processors it would, they could uh, make effective use of. There's a few rules of thumb that you can uh, take advantage of. The WARF model, you can consider it to look like a, uh, the domain, to look like a, a checkerboard. And each, the, the red and black squares are individual uh, cores that are running or solving equations. And in between those uh, squares or those rectangles, uh, communication has to take place. But interior, the, the model is, is able to be fairly independent. Uh, the, more, the more of those checkerboards that you're able to decompose the model into, faster the solution, unless the amount of communication is going to dominate the uh, amount of time it takes to, to do the computation inside. So that's the trade-off. Students are going to have probably between 6 and 12 nodes and anywhere up to a couple of hundred cores. And some of their configurations are going to have GPUs because that's going to be useful on other workloads. Do you think that, that this is primarily a matter of how they set the problem up on the system, how they decompose it? I think you're, you're definitely going to get an impact on the decomposition. For example, if you have a total of, um, let's say, do a simple number, 32 total cores, um, the WARF by default will decompose the domain. It'll take the two factors closest to each other. For 32, it'll be 8 and 4, and it's going to de decompose the y dimension by the largest of those eight and the x dimension by the smallest of those four. Uh, we do that because the first dimension that we run on WARF is the fastest incrementing and we want the longest run inside the uh, inside of cache. So if you if you have 32 processors, it would be an 8 by 4 decomposition if you just say, okay, well, I'll do 3% less, I'll do 31 processors. Then it's a, a prime decomposition. What you end up with is the entire X running uh, in a single run and decomposing the Y direction by, by 31. So by just changing 3% of the number of processors, and you, you certainly wouldn't get a 3% hit in performance, you change drastically the, the decomposition strategy. And if it turns out that having a much longer run in your cache uh, uh, provide you some advantages. You can see some real benefits just choosing the, to add or subtract a, a couple of extra cores in your, uh, in your job. What we don't know, and as we discussed in our pre-call, we don't know exactly what the organizers are going to throw at them. We believe that they'll throw them a, a data set and a result they need to get to and that the students will have, probably have, enough time to do several iterations in order to arrive at the fastest runtime they can get to. Putting yourself in the student's place or as probably more likely a very highly paid consultant to the students, what would you guys recommend that they do first when they first get that data set and their requirements? I guess I'll speak first, Dave, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, physics a little bit, and then, Dave, you might uh, weigh in on the hardware and software configuration tips. The, the weather model uh, has a lot of options uh, for how to represent processes in the atmosphere, and these can return differing levels of, of accuracy and, and goodness of the forecast. But it can be simplified quite a bit by uh, uh, selecting options to uh, minimize the amount of computation and the amount of detail that's putting into the forecast. So as a general rule of thumb, I would uh, look toward the, the simpler physics options that, that may be mentioned in 
um, the wharf literature. But as, as Dave mentioned, one might uh, assume that the, the organizers of this are just going to say, run this particular configuration because uh, it gets into a different exercise to have the students try to guess which physical processes are going to be more time consuming on the computer than others. So uh, I think that probably pushes it more into the realm of how to structure this thing and how to uh, to set compiler options, uh, which I guess, Dave, you, you could probably speak to a bit better. One of the things that I would do if I was first given the, the task is I'm assuming that most of the participants have already started building and running the wharf code. Yes. So maybe in advance of them receiving the uh, instructions on the, the day of the, the competition, I would say ahead of time, I would make sure that I had things were, that were as optimized as possible. The WARF code is able to be built or is able to run in parallel. And it can have two different modes of uh, decomposition, uh, distributed memory with MPI and also shared or threaded with uh, OpenMP. I would say it would be a good idea for students to take some test data sets and run on both of those configurations on their machine and see which, which one they're getting the best results for. Mm -hmm. They can look on the WARF uh, user page if they just Google WARF user guide 3.5 they'll get a user guide that has all of the information about the, the WARF system. Particularly in Chapter 5 is the information on the, the WARF model itself. Yeah. The way that they can determine whether or not the model is behaving as well as possible or if a change is providing any sort of improvement is the model will dump out these output files, and they're called RSL for Runtime System Library dot out and then with four numerals after it and the master node is zero 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 looking in there it tells you the amount of elapsed time it took to do each time step so if you do a dozen time steps and change some compiling options run those same time steps again you'll be able to see the amount of elapsed time that it took to do those those processors by changing from 32 to 33 to 31 uh, cores uh, from doing 32 cores with some of them with OpenMP, some of them distributed memory. Those sorts of pre-tests are things that I think are going to provide a real benefit for users. The WARF model by default will output all of the data from the master node. So when they are designing their, their system, even if they probably don't need to have a uh, I/O hooked up to each one of the the uh, cores, but if they they have a fast interconnect, it's probably going to be required because all of the data has to drain to the master, and the master's uh, going to be the guy that does uh, does the output. As far as seeing if things are working out the day of the day of the experiment, I would go ahead and go with their previous tests that they've conducted that they know this tends to be a, a sweet spot for the, for the production run. And the model uh, will have a, a, a bend in the performance when it starts up. The amount of communication starts to get high. But it will probably go a long way before it, it bends over backwards. And actually adding more processors increases the amount of time. So you may not get to an efficiency level that you want, but time to solution will usually decrease by adding more and more and more processors to it. That's really good advice in there, and I'll throw up a link in the video uh, yep. version to this. I'll also throw up some examples of weather so they know what that looks like. This is yeah. great stuff, guys. Uh, any final tips or traps or anything that uh, they should be aware of? Well, uh, D Dave mentioned an excellent a strategic thing is just to, to run WARF in advance. Yeah. If they have the data in advance rather than trying to learn things in a 12-hour block. They won't have the data, but they will have, there's example data sets up there. Oh, okay. Or and, there are and, example data sets out on the web, I'm sure. Yeah, from the WARF page, which is www.mmm.ucar.edu slash WRF slash users, there are uh, many links uh, there, and there are cases, canned cases, that uh, potential WARF users can pull down to uh, to run. 
uh, Dave may may agree with this. Um, if they have uh, a range of compilers that they are thinking on running on their the hardware uh, and, and systems that they've created, they could in advance take a sample work data set and try the different compilers to see which one yields the fastest executable. That's an idea that comes to, to my mind. Good they one. may find that uh, Intel is uh, running faster than PGI or running faster than new, uh, GNU. Uh, mm. Dave, could you speak to that maybe? Right. Like Jordan said, if the participants before the day of the competition, when they are looking to try to help themselves as much as possible with WARF, there is a good amount of information on the web. And the website that Jordan listed has cases that you can download. If you look for WARF benchmark, uh, there are a number of couple of, at least, test data sets that are a little bit larger that users can download and run through the, the system to make sure that things are working as well as possible. When the users do uh, modify the uh, runtime configuration, you can make a substantial difference with optimization levels, and as long as the model is able to stay stable, I think the, they should be okay. We, we've seen some compiler options uh, that don't give us bit-for-bit -bit reproducible results, uh, but for this competition that would, that would probably be acceptable. The MPI and NetCDF libraries that the team is going to download, they probably are going to be able to choose their distributed memory uh, library, uh, OpenMPI or, or MPitch, for example, and they can probably choose which version of NetCDF they're going to, uh, to play around with. With NetCDF, mm -hmm. if they choose to do data compression, that could probably uh, save them a significant amount of time for I.O. Uh, and that data compression is, is a standard option, and it's available inside of WARF, and it cuts the data down by maybe a factor of two. And if I.O. is... Uh, an issue that's something they can they can certainly take a look at but if they're going to get in there to the, with the nitty-gritty and start messing around with the compiler flags that'll be in that configured out war file other than those two guys the decomposition would be a, a real place to uh, to spend some time so that's something that they thoroughly want to understand hey guys this has been great now are either one of you going to be at ISC I, I will Don't, not no I n how about ah. no I will not. <laughs> That's too bad. So it'd be great to have you guys there as color commentators. What, what? I'd get you blazers. <laughs> That'd be nice. Just be like, why roll to sports? We could walk up and down and talk about what's happening in the wharf world right now as they're running what's it. it. What's the venue? What, and where will it be? Oh, it's in uh, it's in Leipzig, Germany, oh, wow. in the middle of June. Wow, that'd be super. As soon as I sell this whole concept of covering stu student cluster competitions to ESPN, probably like ESPN 8, <laughs> then I'll see if I can get some budget to get some commentators over like you guys. Oh, that'd be super if, if there were a budget for this and, uh, and our schedules per minute, we, we'd love to do it. And again, I'd get blazers. <laughs> we'd have matching blazers, which I think would be Sold. great. <laughs> Well, this has been great, guys. Thank you so much for the time. And, and there's some real serious nuggets of wisdom uh, that you've passed along to the students and stuff that they should be paying attention to in the two-week run-up to the competition. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dan. It's been great talking to you. I uh, just want to wish the contestants the best of luck. And uh, may uh, Navier Stokes and uh, Finite Differencing Force be with them. <laughs> Perfect words to close on. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much.